right, so uh, that said, I'm gonna get started on this. Like I said, I'm gonna try and move fast, do some stuff. Uh, I used to have a whole shtick about all the tools you should have. It took like 45 minutes. We would eat the whole time up and it was kind of a waste of time. So I'm gonna move fast. Feel free to ask questions at any time, okay? Uh, if I feel like we're getting totally bogged down on the questions, I'll move it along. Um, but uh, I know a lot of you probably came here with something in your home that is broken like right now today and you're hoping I'm gonna cover it, odds of me covering it, if you don't ask, are limited, okay? Because a home has like 2 million things that can break. All right, first things first, I'm gonna talk about just a couple of tools everybody should have. Uh, none of this is probably rocket surgery for anybody out there, but hopefully I'm gonna give you a couple of tips about some things that you should maybe upgrade or make a little better in your own toolbox at home. Okay, so first things first, screwdrivers, right? We all have them, we all love them. I'm gonna tell you this right now. You only need one screwdriver for about 95% of the stuff in your home and it's this one right here. Okay, this is what we call a six in one, all right? The six in one is cool because the shaft pulled out right there, okay? The ends of the shaft are two of the six and they are a quarter inch and a fifth, five sixteenths inch nut driver, okay? Then you've got a big and a little Phillips and flathead, okay? Flathead is the minus sign, Phillips is the plus. All right, some of you, this is remedial, that's okay. The cool thing about a six and one is all this snaps together, you can take it apart. I can get into a tiny little space with a tiny little screw, okay, and just use this thing, okay? I can take this nut driver and chuck it into a cordless drill, okay? I can, uh, I can put a Allen key in the end of this and actually put a lot of torque on that screwdriver if I need to. Again, this is going to turn like 80, 90% of the screws that you're ever going to try and turn. So don't, don't go bother and buy. And that thing, by the way, this one, you can get this at uh, the big green store for $2, $2, okay? So you don't need this one, okay, which is like $35. It's like a 12 in one. The back side of this is for re-threading screws. You don't need that. You don't need that, okay? Um, you don't need something that you can touch live electrical with and not get shocked because you shouldn't be touching live electrical, please. Nothing I say here today should make you think you should touch live electrical wires. Uh, this one's kind of cool. This is like a 30 in one. It's like $27. It's great for what it's for. You don't need it, okay? Um, I will say this though. You can buy the upgraded six in one. What's nice about these ones is sometimes they'll put the three eighths nut driver there, okay? Or this one is cool because it's got flats there that I can put a wrench on. Okay, so again, I can really put some torque on this. Okay, so a few extra bucks for something like that is worth it. What I really, really don't want you to have because it's an absolute waste of time. I'm handy. <laughs> is one of these kind of things, okay? Where all the bits and bobs are in like a separate little box, okay? You buy this thing, it's like 32 and one, it's a good price. You're like, yeah, that's great. You put it in your car. By the time you get home, you have lost three of these. They're in your car and they're gone forever. You'll never get them back, okay? So don't get this kind. Um, they're really frustrating. Um, what I will say is if you buy these things, okay? These, you can buy just these as well, okay? So if you do spend a couple extra bucks and get yourself a 10 or an 11 in one that you really like, okay? And then you go, oh no. I lost the Torx one. You can go get it, okay? And if you're the kind of person who went, I won't lose those parts in my car, Dan. Well, you and your organizational self are in great shape. Go ahead and buy all the little bits and bobs you want and keep them in a box, okay? Um, the point is, you can buy just those components. All right, six and one screwdriver. Next up, who knows what these are? Who said, who said that? No, these are not pliers. Anybody else want to take a guess? What are these? These are disappointments. <laughs> These are blood blisters right here. These are destroyed nuts and bolts, okay? These, these are a trip down a horrible, horrible lane of DIY failures, okay? Who said all? Oh, I do. Don't feel bad for them. They don't care. Tools don't mind. All right, listen. These are what we call flip joint pliers, okay? So you're right, they're fine. They're flip joint pliers. And that slip joint right there, that's what it is. They got a big size and a small size, and they don't fit anything. They don't fit anything, they don't grab anything. Because when you open them up nice and wide, 
then they're way out there. You can't grab them with your hands all together. When you push it close, they don't fit anything. These are garbage. Get you one of these, okay? I'm always amazed by this because a lot of homeowners don't even know what this is. Uh, and these are also pliers. They're just way better. They're like a million times better and kind of three bucks more, okay? Uh, this is what's called channel locks. Channel locks is a brand name like Jello or Kleenex, okay? These are technically groove lock pliers. So you go to the store and you say, can I get a pair of groove lock pliers? The attendant's gonna look at you like you get three heads, okay? But these things are way better. First of all, that head being offset just makes it way easier. Usually we're gonna turn things with these, okay? So not being straight on gives me a lot more uh, ability to do that successfully. Two, the longer handle, they're gonna give you more torque in actually squeezing something so that you don't damage it. Additionally, because I have all these grooves to choose from, Thank you. I can keep okay, these feet fairly parallel across a really wide range. So I can grab things from sheet metal to like with this sort of medium sized pair, I don't know, two and a quarter inches and not mess them up, okay? So you can actually take nuts and bolts off with this uh, as long as you don't mind doing a little thing and damaging up to them, okay? You're gonna be able to squeeze nice and hard because these people, even when they're nice and big, stay close together so you can fit them in one hand, okay? Way better, groove flat pliers. You take one tip away, let it be that. All right, moving on. I'm gonna talk about tape measures real quick. I know you guys all know what a tape measure is. There's not a whole lot to be said about tape measures. I wanna point out a couple of things. The first is that if you have an old tape measure, new tape measures don't do this. I don't know why, because they're cheap. An old tape measures though have all kind of cool information on the back. So if you have an old tape measure, don't throw it away, check out the back side of it. All right, more importantly, tape measures nowadays are coming with little magnets on the end. Little magnets in the end are great if you are measuring two in iron objects, but they are a real pain in the butt if you are measuring next to an iron object. <laughs> so to think about, all right, um, a lot of those magnets now come off because they know that this is a possibility. I've never found one that I put back on in my whole life. I've taken them off and then they're gone. They fly. Uh, but what I do want you to see is this. Okay, this right here, the ends. They move. They're supposed to. Your tape measure's not old. Your tape measure's not broken. This isn't poorly manufactured. It's supposed to move. It wiggles the thickness of this piece of metal. And the reason for that is, if I'm going to come over here and measure the inside of this doorway, that thing will push in just a little bit. And then when I take it back over here and measure from the outside of a piece of wood, the tape moves just that thickness so that everything's just right. Kind of cool, right? The other thing, almost every tape measure in the world, say that, and now I have a fancy expensive one in my hand. And I've never looked at. You're kidding me. All right, well, this one, no, nope, there it is, I knew it. It's under the belt clip. Right under there, it tells me how long the tape measure is from this spot to this spot. So that if I come and again, measure right here, okay? I can go, okay, that's 33 inches plus whatever that number is right there on the bottom, okay? And all the tape measures will have that because of course they're different size tape measures, right? So yeah, right here, two and three eighths inch or 60 millimeter, boom, okay? That way you don't have to try and bend it like this and then try and guess what the corner is. Um, so there you go, tape measures, cool. Okay. Dan, whatever you're showing, can you show a close-up for the people in the room? I can. Somebody is asking. I can, yeah. So the two okay. quick things we talked about here, or one, just this little end piece moves just that little bit, oh. okay? Yeah. The other thing is on the back here, right there, it will show the length of the tape measure from here to here. So that when you measure something from the inside, you can just add this number to the number right there. That is weird looking at a fisheye like that. Okay, all right, next. When you buy Ikea furniture, uh, a new faucet, um, uh, maybe certain home assembled 
picture frames or mirrors or things like that, uh, they will often come with an Allen key. Okay, one of these sort of hex shaped things. Okay, and I know what you have done. You all have this in your home. I could go to your home right now. I could open the drawer in the kitchen to the left of the sink, and there's a Ziploc bag with 200 of these things, all unassorted, unnamed, and in there, just randomly about. Okay, go home today. Save yourself the headache. Throw that bag away. You don't need it. You don't need it for two reasons. One, those, those are generally manufactured really, really poorly. Okay. Sometimes they're actually intentionally slightly undercut, meaning slightly smaller, so that when you install that screw for the first time and all the threads are nice and clean and easy and it's just go right in, you can't over torque it, particularly in something like an IKEA piece, and break that sort of crappy MDF. Uh, material that it's made out of because the screw is stronger than the wood. Okay, so it's intended to assemble at once and be thrown away. So let it live its purpose. Okay, <laughs> and then get yourself a set. Okay, a set where they all stick in a holster of some sort and they come out. Don't get the weird one that's like a switch blade with 17. That's that. No, 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 no. That's a trail of tears. You don't want that thing in your life. Because what's going to happen is you're going to open it up and say, oh, that right, it fits. But now this bulky thing in your hand does not. It, you're going to bang it into whatever you're turning. These are nice and slim, and the screws that accommodate them are usually in tight spaces, okay? Um, if you promise never, never to work on a car, a motorcycle, or a boat, you can probably get away in this country with just the ones that say SAE. Okay, so fractional inches. If you ever want to work on a vehicle of any kind, and maybe some plumbing stuff, especially if it's like German, you're going to need the millimeters too. Sorry, there's nothing I can do about it. Don't go trying to squeeze them in the, uh, the wrong one, okay? Because you're just going to mess the threads up. And then you're going to be calling me saying, Dan, I'm going to screw out after I already messed it up, okay? So again, Get a pack, keep it in the toolbox. Which brings me back to the other thing I need you to have, a box for your tools. A box the tools go in so that you can keep all the tools in the box, okay? What I don't want you to do is say, all right, I'm gonna go fix that thing in the bathroom. What do I need? I need a wrench, a uh, screwdriver, and a flashlight. Not that much. Uh, let's see, where's the flashlight? Oh, that's easy. That one's in the kitchen drawer. Why don't we keep it there? A screwdriver, I think, is in my coat pocket from last week. And the wrench, oh, that's at Bob's house. I lent it to him. Going over to Bob's house. Three years later, you haven't fixed anything, okay? <laughs> Go visit Bob whenever you want. Keep your tools in the toolbox, okay? Don't let Bob, he's a jerk. Okay. Uh, but any toolbox is fine. I love a five-gallon bucket. The ones with the little, the little jackets from the five-gallon buckets, all the pockets. Ooh, I got like 20 of those at home. They're fantastic. And you can get a cover. You can get like the, the, the lid with a little rubber seat. Then you've got a, a place to sit while you pretend you're working and nobody will bother you all day. Okay. All right. So uh, that's somebody that. Somebody wants to see the island branch. What's that? Somebody wants to see the island branch close up. They want to see the what? Island branch. Oh, the island branch. Yeah, and you can get yourself, you can totally spend up these. This is the cheap set, right? This is the cheap set. This will do just fine for most of the things you need to do. Okay. Um, if you got the bucks, the, the longer ones are better. Okay. The set with twice as many gets you out of a few jams that you, you might get stuck in if you don't have the big ones. The ones with the little ball at the end, okay, that little ball allows a little bit of wiggle and still engages the head of the screw. It, engage, it allows just enough wiggle at this short end, okay? If you're in an inside corner, that short end will miss, uh, you know, the tabletop. So, like, if you're trying to get a screw here, okay, right? Like, this is up against something, and you're trying to get a screw here, turning that long arm once or twice to get the screw started, and then you can put the short end in and just turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it. That ball allows you to do that without that short arm hitting here. That's what it's for. That's why you pay those two extra bucks. So the decision is yours. Okay. Uh, additionally, 
There's one exception to keeping those lame um, Allen keys that come with your furniture. And it's any time a tool, this is not a tool really at all. This is a plastic molded nut driver. This is a piece of garbage, but it's just the right length and exactly the right size to put in the nut on the bottom of a given faucet. Keep this tool right there. Put the faucet in and then take this to the wall, okay? So same thing with those disposable Allen wrenches. You wanna keep them with the piece of furniture they came with? So you don't have to look for your toolbox next time? That's fine, that's a separate issue, okay? You wanna take this piece of garbage, don't put this in your toolbox, you either throw it out or tape it right under the, under the faucet where it came. That can be really handy, okay? All right, clock guns, clock guns. If you own a home, you should be putting two tubes of caulk in your house every year. It's just sort of an average based on the idea of how much caulk there is in the house and that it always falls apart, okay? So there are two types of caulk as far as I'm concerned. All right, and that's it. If you know what you want, there's some really advanced, like high-tech caulks out there. And they're great. I'm not trying to knock those products. If you don't know what you're after, if you go to the store and you're like, well, uh, because <laughs> there's like a whole aisle of caulk, right? As far as I'm concerned, there's two caulks, silicone and latex, and that's it. The only question you got to ask yourself is first, is the thing I'm trying to seal wet? Okay, if it's wet, or if it's going to get wet, or if you want to keep water from getting in whatever it is you're sealing, silicone. Is it dry? I'm just trying to cover it up, cover up a crack so I can paint over it. Uh, door jam on the inside of my house. Maybe I want to seal a little air, but it's not going to see any moisture. Latex, okay? Latex is a little easier to work with, dries faster, doesn't smell bad. Silicone is going to stand up to water over the long term. Only other question you got to ask is what color do I want, okay? All the other stuff, there's great products. Don't, don't worry your pretty little head about it, okay? Just go silicone, latex, be done, all right? Caught gun. Things I want you to know about a caulk gun are one. Almost every caulk gun will have the following three features. You may not even realize they're there. Usually right here or right here, there's some sort of, it's labeled on this one, this little hole, that little hole, that's for cutting the tip off the tube. Says, so see? See, so many guys out there were like, yeah, we know what the whole thing move on, dude. But somebody went, huh? Oh. Okay, so yeah, all right. So that's there, and that's to cut the tip off of this. Okay, it does a fairly decent job if you have a nicer caulk gun. If you have a cheap caulk gun, it's probably just going to mangle this. Don't waste your time. Use a razor knife. Okay. Two, when you cut the tip off of it, there's usually a foil seal where the little plastic nozzle meets the big bottle. There's foil in there, okay? Don't be the idiot. Everybody's done it who works in construction. Every like 19 year old does this one time and then never does it again. We just put this in here and go, I don't have a nail or something long enough. I'm just gonna squeeze it real hard and that foil will pop. No, it won't. <laughs> What'll happen is we'll all spray out the back and give you a big mess and ruin the tube of caught, okay? And then get you yelled at by your boss. I know these things. <laughs> um, the way you get that foil seal is again, it's already built in. It's like they knew it was gonna be necessary. Yeah. They put it right there. And one of the things your boss will yell at you is, what do you think that's for? I'll say, I didn't even know that was there. How did I do that? Uh, so um, again, almost every cock gun will have it, okay? Um, but sometimes they hide it. Usually it's kind of like right around here. Sometimes it's in the handle. You're just looking for that, okay? All right, last thing. See that right there? You probably all know that that's so that after I squeeze the tube of caulk out, I can pull it back, right, and get the tube of caulk out, which it is true, true. It's also for this, though. You come over here and you say, I'm going to do this. Squeeze the caulk, right? And you go, 
Okay, I'm gonna put this down here. No, 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 no. I'm gonna wipe this. There you go. Man, I'm glad I went to that thing. I'm so proud of myself. Dan was right on. I can do anything. That looks great. I saved myself a bunch of money. Oh no. And now there's a big pile of cock right here. Okay. Because when you squeeze this, you're advancing this plunger, you're creating pressure in there. This thing doesn't know when you hit the end of the tub. And it doesn't care even if it did know. But if you push just this little button one time, it releases the pressure. And then this will stop oozing. Okay. It's still a good idea that I have like a rag or something to put it on. All right. Like, but but this is all you gotta do, just push it one time. Okay, that's what it's there for. Okay. Um, but if you're in the in the market for a cock gun. This right here is the most important feature as far as I'm concerned. Because they do have a couple other options, all right, which are some of them can only advance if this is turned one way. And so to relieve pressure, you turn this the other way. That is a pain, man. That is a lame way to build this cock gun. What a waste. Uh, I will say I looked once uh, for a long time at two cock guns that looked almost identical and one cost $4 more. And it was this cutout that costs you four dollars more. And the reason for this cutout is it fits nicer in a toolbox. Mm -hmm. So, do you if you want to spend that four dollars? I'm not telling you what to do with your money, but I thought that was silly when I figured it out. Okay, those are all the basic hand tools I intend to cover today. Uh, how are we doing on time? Anybody? Uh, no clock. Yeah, go ahead. Seven. Six fifty-five. Six fifty-five. Okay. All right. All right. We'll make it through. We're doing all right. Okay. I'm gonna move on to some skills that I really think people should uh, try and tap, okay? Uh, as you're learning, as you're growing, as you're doing these kind of things and getting a little better at it, these are absolutely projects I think every homeowner should at least try, okay? First, drywall, okay? And when I say that, what I don't mean is drywall your entire kitchen, okay? In fact, I rarely recommend that, even if you're remodeling the whole kitchen yourself. Hire the drywall guys. They're really fast and they're kind of cheap. But, but when it comes to patching drywall, it can cost you so much money and usually not work out well. Because those guys that are really, really good at drywall and really, really fast and kind of cheap, they want to do whole houses, man. If you call them and you're like, yeah, I got like, like one crack and a hole this big, how much will that be? They just hang up the phone. They don't even want to talk to you. Now you can find a handyman. You can find a handyman who'll come out. You don't want a handyman. You drywall all that often. At it, okay. If you can pay for it, you want it to look great. If you can do it yourself and it doesn't look great, you can do it again. No big deal. All right. Two things I want you to know that drywall stuff is cheap. The materials are cheap. All right. Plaster. Why is somebody always going to bring up plaster? Listen. That's what my house is. Uh, if, if what you're doing in plaster is simply making a repair, okay, you can absolutely use uh, modern gypsum products to fill holes, repair cracks. Um, usually, the plaster will be harder. So over time, that crack, that damage will reappear. Depends what caused it in the first place. Okay. plaster uh, I mean, you can you can buy this stuff yourself. It's all all plaster in. It's just harder, really, right? Like it's it's just a stronger um, product at so the I end. It's you to replace the lath. No. No. <laughs> no. No. You can find people that do that, but and this is my point: is small repairs. Just use this stuff, okay? If you wanted to replace the lath. If you were rebuilding a historic home and you said, no, I want plaster and lath walls, that's a skill, man. Don't like hire a professional and they're going to cost what they cost. And they should because that's essentially an art form at this point. Okay. Um, but you want to patch a crack? Go nuts. Okay. Uh, and the things I want to point out to you is this. So it's, it's really cheap stuff. Okay. You're going to need some tape. All right. This paper tape is the most basic stuff. This is literally three dollars worth this will last you your entire lifetime okay the problem is you're going to use it twice and then it's going to get wet and you're going to need to go buy it again um but it's only three dollars and it hasn't gotten more expensive in 25 years like it was a dollar 50 25 years ago it's at like 285 now 
So, um, so all you do, the, the paper tape or the fiber tape, the stuff that looks like mesh, it's really up to you as preference. Um, the mesh stuff is a little harder to cover, okay? A little easier to apply. Um, the paper stuff has a tendency to fall off sometimes. The key is you actually have to get that covered with joint compound before you try and stick it to the wall, okay? When you're patching, there are three products. And there's one of them that's an absolute waste of your life. Okay. So there are three products. There's the old stuff. It's a dry powder. You mix with water. It's wet. You smear it on, right? Smooth it out. And you got to wait 24 hours to come back and repower it. That stuff is a waste of time. There's two reasonable choices. The first choice is the expensive choice. That's the stuff you buy in buckets and it's pre mixed and it's wet and it's ready to go. All right. I don't like that stuff. I like that stuff for a couple of reasons. One, once you buy it, you've got to use it, man. So, like, line up all your little things and dents in your house and figure them out if you're going to bother to buy. Because even a small bucket goes kind of a long way. It's also pretty expensive, okay? And it tends to be a little thick, so you got to end up mixing it with a, just a little bit of water anyways, okay? Another thing I don't like about that um, is you still have to wait usually 24 hours to put that second coat on. Okay, and especially for an amateur, when it comes to drywall repair, you're usually looking at like three coats, the minimum, before you want to try and sand, prime, and paint. Okay, this stuff, on the other hand, you are going to have to mix it yourself. It just takes water. Usually, you have water available if you're doing anything at a home. Okay, so the other thing is, see this one right here, that number five? That's what you're looking for. Is one with the number, okay? They sell it in both easy sand and not easy sand, okay? The not easy sand is harder to sand. Usually costs a little bit less, okay? That number is the anticipated working time of the product. So I mix it up, I should have about five minutes before it starts to harden up. And then I can recoat in five minutes. Okay, you can buy this stuff in a, in a bunch of numbers, uh, anywhere from five to 90. Uh, I think they maybe even make a, a 120. Um, the point is, I can get those three coats on and an hour, right? Mix up a bucket. Wait, come back, mix up another bucket. Go have a beer, come back, third coat. Maybe, maybe you use the 20 now. Okay, and spend an extra minute making it nice and smooth. But thin, small layers are going to allow you to do a nice job. Okay, it doesn't require a lot of sanding. That's where you're going to mess it up. Because if it requires a lot of sanding, you're going to get tired. You're going to give up. I was 25 and sanding. I'm like, this is stupid. I don't want to do this. Okay, now that I'm 43, I got about that much sanding in me before I'm like, let me paint it and see how it looks, okay? I can always come back, right? Yeah, go ahead. Are you sanding between each coat? No, no. Only sand that last coat, okay? When you come up to the dry bit after the first coat, knock off any big snots, okay? And there's a, there's a little, you know, things you can see, just kind of like one little with the putty knife, and then go back on with that second coat and that third coat, okay? You only want to sand the last one, okay? What's the size of the putty knife so you're using? Or bigger than your hole <laughs> yeah i mean you know are, are we talking about you know where where you pull the screw and you got a hole like that you can barely stick a pencil in ah. okay. you know uh, you can do that with a rubber putty knife. you you can do that with anything right are you are you patching a, a two foot by three foot hole <laughs> and you're going to be putting the, the tape on the seams uh, get yourself an eight or 10 inch putty knife to do that final coat. Okay. The bigger the putty knife, again, the easier it's going to be to make a nice thing that requires less sanding. Here are the other two tips when it comes to patching a hole. Number one, you got a hole in your wall that's already there. You got the board you're going to patch it with, right? This hole is like a half snowman with like a jagged edge over here. Don't take these measurements. And then try and cut a half a snowman with a jagged tail over here and put it in there. No, 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 no. Take the square. You don't have to get it perfect. It can have a little bit of a trapezoidal shape or whatever, right? Just make sure it's bigger than the hole. Put this on the wall. 
trace and cut nice, simple edges and put the, that in. So instead of trying to match some irregular, weird shape, just work with the shape you already have that's easy to function, okay? Put that on the wall, cut the hole bigger, all right? It also gonna give you nice edges, because now you just cut clean lines, whereas what happened is the bowling ball got thrown through the wall, right? Um, okay, so that's that. The other thing is, if you're doing a patch, okay, particularly in plaster, I have found this very effective. You can get away with getting slightly thinner drywall, most of the time, drywall is half inch thick. Sometimes it's five eighths. Every once in a while, it's double thick. Whatever, it doesn't matter. You can get drywall that's a little thinner. So if you got half inch by three eighths, all right. And then instead of trying to just putty those edges, you fill the whole hole, right? Put that backer in, and then you're filling that whole gap with the, the blaster of the mud. Okay. It what it does is it allows just one edge that needs to be feathered out. Instead of two, all right. Yeah, go ahead. What do you recommend to put behind it to hold it in its place? Anything, any piece of wood you got laying around. As long as the reason the hole's there is because uh, you know your your nephew threw a fit and um, threw his buddy against the wall, right? If what it is is where the doorknob is hitting, then you got to reinforce that, right? If it's something that's going to happen again, well, now you got to worry about this structure behind it to protect that from happening in, in the future. Uh, usually what I actually like to do in that situation is put some decorative on the wall anyways. Because no matter what you do, if you put drywall, the drywall's going to dent, right? You put a two by eight screwed to the studs with giant lag bolts, oh, it's not going anywhere. But the drywall is still going to get things up all the time, okay? So take a nice piece of maple, miter the edges, stain it, glue that to the wall. And then the door can hit the maple, which is nice and hard, and not do the damage. Okay? Um, but if this is just in the middle of the wall, all you need is some kind of stick. Okay, Put a little caulk or construction adhesive. Stick's got to be longer than the hole, right? Stick it in there, hold it, put a screw through the drywall that's still good. Usually two sticks is the right number. Okay. And stick that patch on and screw to those, okay? And anything, piece of one by four, one by three, it doesn't have to be good or strong or, you know, because drywall is not a strong material. It's just something we can throw paint on and, and be nice, okay? That's why it's so easy to put a hole in drywall, all right? Okay, uh, but drywall is really cheap materials, really easy to work and no risk. You mess up drywall, what happened? Nothing. You've lost nothing but time, okay? You can absolutely try again. You didn't even make it harder to try again, okay? You, uh, you didn't do any damage to your home. You didn't change the resale value of your home. You didn't violate any code laws. You didn't put yourself or your family at risk. Drywall is easy and a great way to save some money. Additionally, let's say you're bringing in a real contractor to do some electrical or some plumbing and they've got to cut a hole in the wall. They love it if you go, I'll fix the wall. You don't have to even worry about it. Really? Ooh. First of all, it means they don't have to be cool about cutting the hole. They don't have to worry about it. Just hit them with a hammer, which isn't necessarily great for whoever's coming behind them. But what it does mean is they're going to access whatever they need to access. What they're not going to do is go, I know I got to fix this patch at the end of the day, so I don't want to cut any more holes than I have to. And I really should have cut a hole there, but I think I can reach it this way. They're not going to put themselves in that situation trying to save themselves some time. They're going to bang another hole in the wall and leave it for you. But they will usually knock a few bucks off a bill, right? Because they were either going to have to do it themselves, and that means they might have to send their helper back the next day to finish that job, right? Or they were going to hire a subcontractor, all right? And that subcontractor is either their buddy who does drywall on the side who wants to do whole kitchens and doesn't want to keep fixing their patches, or it's the handyman that they know is going to do a mediocre job and leave you mad. So they're happy if you do that for them, okay? Uh, so it can save you a couple of bucks. All right, next, electrical. Do your own electrical work. Totally okay. I mean it. People think I'm crazy. You got to follow three rules. Three rules, okay? And don't mess with me. I mean it. These are real. These are not negotiable. Rule number one, 
Turn off all of the power in the box, okay? Not just the circuit that holds the item you are working on, but all of the power that is exposed in the box that you are working on, okay? And we'll talk about that a little more in a second. That's rule one. Rule two, you may only replace something with the same thing. You can replace a switch with a switch, a light with a light, a fan with a fan, an outlet with an outlet. Don't open up the wall and go, well, I have one outlet here, but what I want is three outlets and a switch. No, 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 no. And number three, those are the things you can replace. Outlets, <laughs> lights, switches, fans, okay? These are breakers. You can't replace these. That's not for you. No, no, no. Okay, if I gotta tell you how to do this, you're not ready, all right? This is where you hire somebody, okay? But you can turn it off. That's totally yours, okay? You can also reset it, by the way. The little thing I found out a lot of people don't realize because it doesn't happen a whole lot is if a circuit breaker trips, right? Like that's the job, right? Like my toaster shorts out and this bump goes like that, right? And now I can't power. And I go down to my basement and I find this and I say, oh, these will usually, most brands, when they trip, they don't trip all the way to off and look like this. They trip in the middle, okay? And it can be a little hard to spot, especially if you're in a dark basement, particularly old breakers that haven't tripped in a long time will often actually sit right there. It tripped electrically, but the little switch didn't move. But as soon as you touch it, even lightly, it moves, okay? Um, to reset them, you must push them all the way off first and then back on. I have had no less than three calls to somebody's house. I think the breakers burnt out or something. I don't know. I can't reset it. And they were just trying to turn it to on and it wouldn't do it. And I just went, you're done. You owe me $200 now because that's my minimum call and I feel bad. Do you want me to wash your bathroom floor or something? It's like, I don't. I don't want to charge you, but the job's done. Um, you know, and that, that is a real, that is a reality of, of being a handyman sometimes. There are plenty of times when I showed up to somebody's house. Oh, my furnace is broken. I don't know what's going on. Okay, cool. Cool. Heat. Why'd you have it in air conditioning? What? <laughs> well, I'm here now. I'll do the PM. We'll just clean it, okay? All right, so. Uh, when it comes to this, you do need a couple of specialty tools, okay? I'm going to show you. I have a meter that looks like this. This is actually my cheap meter that I keep in my car because I love my meters. I have like five of them. You don't need anything like this. If you have one, you know how to use it. Good for you. If you don't, don't worry about that. What I want you to have if you're going to do any electrical is two separate devices, two because of redundancy, okay? That way, if they give different results, you investigate further. Well, this one says the power's off, and this one says the power's on. Who will I trust? <laughs> no, they both need to say the power's off, okay? So there's this kind of guy. See, do I have an outlet that's high up? Yeah, okay. Some of you will be able to see this. You guys over here, sorry. Okay, so this plugs right in here. <laughs> It lights up, okay? The lights on this tell you that the outlet is powered, and it's even a little chart here that tells you whether it's wired or not correctly. I'm gonna go ahead and hand that out. You guys can just pass that up. When it gets to the back, you set it on a chair. I'll collect it at the end. The only problem with that thing is, that thing's great. The only problem with it is it only works for outlets. You wanna change a switch? You wanna change a light? You want to change a fan? That thing won't do anything for you, okay? But that'll tell you once you turn the breaker off that the outlet's on, okay? And when you're all done, it'll tell you if you wired the outlet right, okay? So it's great for outlets. What's it called? Outlet tester. <laughs> I think. Uh, th these have really boring names. It's called an outlet tester or something like that. Um, and it's... The price on these has gone up a little bit recently, but even I think it's like five to eight dollars for that guy. It's not expensive. Um, the next thing you must have one that is this kind of a thing. Okay, this is the cheapest uh, that I found. This is seven dollars. 
And it's cool because it comes with a tiny little screwdriver in it that you'll never need. Okay. Um, this is a non contact voltage detector. You must have a non contact voltage detector. And the reason is this I plug that thing in, it tells me the outlet's on. I go to the breaker panel. I hit the breaker. Then I go ahead and start taking things out. And I go, oh, there's like 18 wires back here. Now I can take this and just stick it in there. Any wire, even if the whole wire just passes through and it's completely insulated, there's no exposed metal, this will tell me if there's power running through that wire. And I want you to then find that breaker and shut that one off too. Okay. Non contact voltage detector. Okay. So that if you slip with your screwdriver and cut that insulation, you don't get hurt. Okay. Because you're not allowed to work on anything live. This will assure you that everything in the box is off. So when this stops beeping, that's when you can stop turning off breakers. Now, yeah, I'm going to pass the time too. The other thing, if you're working on a light or a switch, you should have one of these, okay? It's the cheap version of this. This thing's like $100 to $200, depending on what you get. This is like nine bucks, okay? But it only does one thing. That thing does a whole bunch of things. It only does one thing. There's two little wire leads in here. You touch them to metal, and it will tell you if there's power in it. But remember, you must touch the terminal and ground. Okay? All right? And you talk uh, more about that till the, till the cows come home. But if you have those couple of devices, outlets are just a few screws. Okay? This is what you see. You take this screw out. This is what you see. You take these two screws out, you get access to the sides. The wires go right here. You take those screws off. You get the shiny new one. Those screws in reverse. Okay. The whole job takes about five minutes. Okay. Then you can turn the power back on. I'll see you. I'll get you in a second. Here. One way I like to tell people to do power, by the way, fix your electrical during the daytime. Okay. Open the windows. <laughs> and then just go turn off all your power and don't worry about it. I still want you to have the non contact voltage detector. Okay. The reason is because I have seen crazier things than a wire run outside of the entire circuit breaking system. I have seen that. It is terrifying. And I hope that you never encounter that, but it happens. So better safe than sorry to take that five minutes and that eight box and go beep, 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 beep. Additionally, Make sure it goes beep, 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 beep before you turn off the power because if the battery in that thing is dead, <laughs> it never goes beep, 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 beep. So make sure it goes beep, beep, beep first, turn the breaker off, then it'll stop going beep, 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 beep. Okay? What you don't want to do is go, yeah, David, it was good. It was good. Well, let's let me check the battery in that thing, honey. Oh, <laughs> I haven't used this thing in five years. That's good. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Turn off all the power, do your work during the daytime. It's really easy that way. Okay. If your refrigerator's off for 20 minutes, your ice cream ain't gonna melt. You're gonna be okay. All right. Um what is the last tool called? The last tool. Um who's got it? What's it what's it called? Okay, I'll hold it up with the camera. Voltage tester. Yeah, these things are the like silly. I mean, I should have guessed what's it. Well, electrical tester device. <laughs> Non-contact voltage detector. That's the only one you really got to worry about remembering. The other ones are going to be so obvious. If you go to the uh, any of the big box stores or uh, Ace Hardware or something, start looking at their tools, it's going to be pretty fast and easy, okay? And they all come with bells and whistles, right? The non-contact voltage detector, they got ones with flashlights in them and ones that can tell you what voltage is running through it. Yeah, it's pretty money if you want, it's up to you. I just care that you have a non-contact voltage detector because that will tell you uh, without having to expose a metal live electrical whether or not it's there. How are we doing on time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh my god! I apologize. All right, I got plenty to say. <laughs> Anybody want to ask a question? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, switching up your electrical outlet to mm -hmm. like a like a USB charger is that something? Okay, so like if I want to take this outlet yeah. and put in the fancy new ones that got the USB, totally.
totally easy. Additionally, I'm glad you asked. You want to put in a GFCI? Well, you had one of these? Totally okay. That's not an upgrade. That's not a change. What is it? What's that? This GFCI, these are the ones by your sinks with the little buttons on them. Okay. So this guy has no idea what's happening. This is not a smart device. This is just a piece of wire encased in plastic. This thing protects it. Okay. If there's a short, this will trip and save the building. Okay. This is 15 or 20 amps worth of power to make it do that. 15 amps will kill you dead seven times a week, okay? 15 amps will leave you smoking on the floor. And this thing will sit there and just pass power through it. <laughs> okay? This thing does not care about you. This thing loves you. This thing loves you. We put these in your sinks and things like that so that if your hands are all wet and then you go to plug in your coffee pot, this will know any amount of voltage leaked to what they call ground. So this is not how electricity works. This is not how electricity works. This is not how electricity works. How electricity works is it comes out of this little hole, runs through the device and comes back in this little hole. That's not how it works. But that's how we're gonna say it works for now because it's good enough, okay? This device hasn't got a clue, doesn't know anything. This device measures the amount going out, and the amount coming back. And if it senses any difference between those two, it shuts off. Okay. When these shut off, sometimes they trip these. Sometimes they don't, but that doesn't indicate a problem. If this trips, when this trips, you don't need to call an electrician in panic. Okay. You want to see it. GFCIs. I'm holding it upside down. Okay. So all you gotta do is hit the reset button on them usually. Okay, you cannot reset them if there's no power. You cannot reset them once they break, all right? Um, and these do fail occasionally, okay? So if these fail, replace it, okay? Not much to it. Question? Yeah. How much do the remaining costs? You know, sometimes- How much what? How much do the remaining costs? Oh, um, you know what? I take a long screw, put it in the hole, the longest, biggest screw I can find that'll fit in the hole, and then I wrap electrical tape over it. Works for me. Um, you know, you're never gonna keep a, a tube of caulk for a year, you know? And why would you? A tube of caulk is five or $6. It's not really worth it to put a ton of energy into it. A screw, some electrical tape, totally will make it last for a week or so. Ooh, here's a fun tip. If you're painting, you want to take a break, right? You don't need to wash your brush. You don't need to wash the roller. You don't need to wash any of it. Cover it in some plastic or some tin foil, something like that. All you're trying to do is keep it from making a mess. You're not trying to create an airtight seal and put it in the freezer. You can leave it there for a month and then come back to finish that job. Been there, done that. Yeah, you can absolutely, there are plenty of times when I've been working on a place, halfway done with the job. Don't want to, you, you lose a lot of paint when you wash a roller, okay? You lose time by washing a roller that so you're just going to get wet with the same paint again next time you're there. Put a little foil on it so it make a mess, throw it in the freezer, head out, come back the next day, ready to rock. Okay, you do have to let it thaw. That can take a minute, all right? Uh, questions? What's your number? Ah, <laughs> uh, so looks like we're out of time, everybody. No, I no longer do this kind of work uh, for hire, except for a few select clientele and my mom. Yeah, go ahead, man. Uh, what would you do if a light is flickering in the bathroom, and if all the other lights are working from just one light? One light flickering. Yeah, and you have a row of three lights, but just one light in the middle is flickering. Okay, step one, of course, is change the bulb. All right. Yeah, I figured you did. Step two, okay, step two. Well, uh, is it on a dimmer? Yeah. On off. Yeah. Are we talking about LEDs? Yeah. Okay. Uh, step two, um, what is sometimes a problem, although not usually the issue, is if you, uh, but although particularly in a bathroom, turn the power off, okay? And I would prefer 
My lawyers are making me say this. I actually don't care. I would prefer you turn off at the breaker, not at the switch, because if the light has been wired, uh, reverse polarity, the light won't care. It'll go on and off. It'll do everything it's supposed to. But as soon as you do what I'm about to tell you to do, you might put yourself at risk. So I would prefer you to do it at the breaker. I don't care. Um, take a pencil and a little piece of sandpaper and glue it to the eraser and stick it right down the center where if you look at a light bulb, it's got the metal screw and then a little metal dot at the end where that metal dot touches, that's where the electricity comes in. Especially in a bathroom where it's steamy sometimes, if that gets corroded, it'll mess up with it, especially an LED because it needs uh, clean power to operate successfully. Mm -hmm. Rub that with the pencil, just twist it, twist it, twist it, twist it, put it back in, turn your breaker on, flip the switch, see if that helps. Okay. Uh, other than that, now you're getting into the wiring of the device. Um, some, sometimes uh, what you'd be looking for is just a loose wiring connection inside. Okay. Um, sometimes those are going to be soldered connections that are probably not something you are going to want to fix. And you're just talking about a new light. Um, sometimes it's these kind of things and you can go ahead and put it back together yourself. I have a switch downstairs, mm -hmm. switch upstairs, switch downstairs does nothing. Mm -hmm. Switch upstairs and turn on, light no, flickers, and mm -hmm. then turns off, turn the other way, flickers, and goes down. I want to make sure I got this. Yeah. So you got two light, two switches, two switches. like on the stairs? Yep. So this, it yeah. should be, I can turn it on or off here, and I can do the same up here. It should be a three-way. I suspect what you have is not a three-way switch. In both of these, okay. It's been on there for years, and then it just happened. Oh, it just started. Yeah. So it used to work fine, and now it started doing this. Okay. Um, I knew we. I knew we needed the whiteboard. That's a light bulb. Right. Sorry, I got nervous. I got nervous. Everybody, I apologize. Okay, here we go. So there's my two wires, okay? The way a three-way switch works, here's my breaker panel, okay? Don't worry about this. Um, this is my switch and this is my switch, okay? So when I flip the switch on a three-way, instead of cutting the power on or off, it just changes the route from here to here, hmm. okay? For the light to go on, I need to have a full loop from here to here. So right now the light's on. If I switch either of these switches, The light will go off. Okay. So what you are saying is I flip this switch, nothing happens. Nothing happens no matter what I do. I flip this switch, this blinks on, this blinks on and then goes off. Mm -hmm. And then you flip it the other way, it blinks on and goes off. <laughs> mm. That's not great. No. Okay. <laughs> what that implies is that this here, okay, has connected somehow to both wires, okay, because this does nothing anymore, and you can still get power, and this, okay, whether I turn it on or off, turns this on momentarily. My suspicion is that what has happened is inside of this box, Something along the lines of a wire nut has come loose, okay? And what you've done is permanently connected this circuit and that the switch or the light or something is sensing the ground. Is it an LED? Is any of this smart all stuff? Days. What's that, all old days stuff? Yeah. Okay, that's actually good. Um, but same rule applies. These are just switches. Okay. They're a little more complicated. My advice would be, do all the power, two new three-way switches, place them both, okay? 
And when you are replacing it, check any wire nuts, okay? Um, and what you wanna do, take the old wire nut off. Ideally, get yourself a pair of these, they're called linemans, okay? Take the old wire nut off and retwist all the wires, okay? If any of them look burnt and corroded or anything like that, wire strippers, okay? Cut a new end, peel the insulation off. The gauge for the wire is marked right there, okay? I think that would be fine. My guess is that one of these devices has failed on you and this is reparable. Be aware that you may open it up and go, oh, stuff's cooked, okay? Uh, especially if you encounter a box that is just like crammed full of wires or because it is old if you're dealing with cloth wrapped wire. Um, I'm not telling you you can't touch cloth wrapped wire, just know that as you start working with cloth wrapped, sometimes the insulation just kind of like falls the heck apart, at which point you may want to go, hey, uh, I started this job already, okay? Um, but yeah, I think I think if you just replace those with two new three ways, you're gonna be fine. Um, and uh, And if you do have solid, okay, so solid wiring versus stranded wiring, Okay, so the copper itself, if it's one solid piece wrapped in insulation versus all the little feathers, right? Okay. Uh, if it's feathers, if it's stranded, you gotta use this kind of device. Okay. Um, they make little devices that you can push things in. Okay, those are great. They take up a lot less space sometimes and can be really helpful in these old situations, um, but they're only for solid core wiring. Same thing when you're looking at these, okay? They'll have, They'll always have a screw terminal available. Screw terminal can handle anything. They'll sometimes have a little hole in here that you can push to connect. Those are fine. Push it all the way in. Look at the strip gauge, which is on the back here. You'll see it. Follow that to the letter of how much exposed metal. Push it in and give it a good yank back, okay? Because what it is, it's a little piece of metal on the inside that you're going to push past, and then it bites into it. Okay, so if you just give it a little yank, it kind of sets it dig the steel into the copper, makes a better connection, makes it stronger and last. Um, I got no problem with those push to connect, but they're only for solid and they're only for, it'll say right on it, what gauges they can accept. Okay, so you can't use too small, you can't use too big. Um, Food terminals are always built. Okay. Anybody on there? Yeah. 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 You gave a good list that, oh, you can do this. Could you maybe give us some of your don't do that. Don't do that. Okay, yeah. Um, again. Okay. Um, plumbing. I, I, uh, I always told you, do electrical, go nuts. The beauty of electrical is if you mess it up, you need to go turn the power back on. It's just going to trip, right? It's going to tell you, hey, you messed up. And you're going to go, oh, what if I did? Just start again, right? Okay. This thing is like, because of the danger of electricity, it's already built in. So if you follow the three rules I put, you're not putting yourself in danger because you've killed all the power, okay, before you touch it. And when you turn it back on, if you've made a mistake, it will tell you right away, okay? Plumbing, you make a mistake and then button it up and you have a small leak that you didn't notice. <laughs> By the time you notice that, you may have rotted out things, caused mold, done all kinds of damage. God forbid it happens on a weekend when you're away in Cabo, right? <laughs> um, like plumbing has a lot greater risk. Now I do suggest the little plastic uh, between the sink and the wall or these things. Go nuts, kids. Replace these till your heart's content. It's super easy. Please don't call people to replace this until you've at least tried, okay? <laughs> these things, that, like a bag of this is five bucks. Which is the other thing is, don't worry about which of these you need most of the time, right? You can buy little individual rings for 35 cents. If you know what you need, great. But if you don't, the whole bag is like five bucks, okay? Um, uh, so yeah, so I, I do caution people, don't do any plumbing inside the walls. Um, I don't recommend people do major drywall, even though it's fairly cheap, unless you've done a lot of it. Because um, if you mess up drywall, like if you if you remodel your whole kitchen, right? You frame out that whole wall, go nuts, do it. I support it, right? But when that drywall goes up, if at the end you don't have a nice, beautiful flat surface, your whole remodel looks terrible. Okay, so I, I say hire that out. Um, 
Uh, similarly, I often would act, I often actually have hired out painting, uh, even though it's easy, because painters, although it's less less and less true, painters are often something you can acquire kind of cost effectively, and they're so fast. Uh, if you're painting one wall, one bedroom, do that yourself. You want to paint your whole house that you just bought, right? Hire somebody. Don't 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 waste your time. Uh, heating and air conditioning. Heating and air conditioning, not only do I recommend, there's very, very little that you can do yourself, except for change the furnace filter often, okay? All right, my advice is the cheapest filter that fits in the box. Change it every 30 days, okay? Here, go ahead. I just want to suggest for that, since I did myself, don't be in a hurry when you change the filter, when you take off the wrap, because what happened to me last winter is, that paper that sticks kind of kind of like uh magnetic sticks in there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it was still in there and it almost blew my blower up. Yeah. yeah. I had this noise. I thought my and if I had to call it, which my husband said it's all in your head, there's nothing wrong, <laughs> then we would have blew our blower up. So make sure all the paper is out of there before you stick it in there. And yeah. Don't be in a hurry because that's what they did. Yeah. Uh I will say. Ah, it wouldn't have blown the blower out. Uh, you had chopped that piece of paper up. Eventually, it gone right through it. It burned up on the heat exchanger, and you just smelled it, and it never figured out what the problem was. And the guy that came at that point would be like, oh, you need a whole new furnace, man. <laughs> uh, so that's what would have happened. It would have cost you like eight grand. Um, so yeah, so be, be careful of that. But uh, change your own furnace filter, of course. Um, but other than if it's out, turning it off and turning it on, I don't really want you doing anything with the heating there. I know I say that as a guy who ran a heating and air company, so maybe I'm a little biased, but that's pretty specialized trade. It really is. Like the idea of like hosing off your condenser, a lot of people do that themselves. I usually don't recommend that. You can actually mess it up, okay? By the way, don't cover your condenser, the outdoor unit for your air conditioner, in the winter. There's no reason for that. The people that sell those, those covers, it's a scam, right? All that does is make a nice little place for rats to hide the winter through, okay? And they will mess it up. Like it's, 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 this thing was built to live outdoors. Let it be happy. All right, um, but the reason I recommend getting involved with an HVAC contractor to do the annual PMs, okay? They'll try and sell you, hey, we should come out here every three months. No, 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 you don't need that. We should come out every six months. We'll do a, a free season summer, a free season winter. Okay, okay, if you want to, that's okay. Have us out at least once a year. <laughs> All right, have them out once a year in the fall and then wait a year and a half and have them out in the spring and then do the same thing, okay? So that once a year, it's getting looked at, all right? But every other year is the furnace and the air conditioner, okay? For most people, that will get you by without an issue, okay? Sometimes uh, you have a environmental situation that requires that air conditioner condenser outside to be cleaned every year, okay? Um, but, uh, but the reason I want you to establish that connection is it gives you a low cost opportunity to evaluate an HVAC contract. You're bringing them in for the PM and for like, you know, a hundred bucks, right? They usually advertise in like 85, but by the time they actually talk, well, we have to do this and we have to do that. And no, right, it's 120. Um, it gives you a low cost opportunity to evaluate that person. And does two things. One, if that person goes, well, it was supposed to be 85, but we had to do this and that and this and that and the other, it's 294 bucks. You don't ever have to call that person again. Right? Because they're a jerk. That shouldn't happen. <laughs> Even in a situation where you do have that work, they should tell you about it before it happens. Mm -hmm. Right? If they're coming to you at the end of the day with a bill that's surprising, don't ever work with them again. Okay? If they're late, if they don't communicate right, it gives you an opportunity to interview this person before you find yourself with the furnace instead. Because when the furnace dies, you've got to replace it in this country or in this, this you, you know, in Chicago land. We don't make it through winters without furnaces here. We freeze to death if we try, right? Your roof and your furnace, you gotta replace them, right? Kitchen remodel, that can wait a year if you need, right? Bathroom remodel, that can wait, but you gotta evaluate. And if you establish that relationship, you got somebody coming out once every year, once every six months. When your blower motor fails, they're gonna be honest with you, right? Maybe they'll make the effort. Ah, oh, you know what, Jackie? I can get out there today. I, I can get out there. It, it, I'll make it by the end of the day, I promise. First time caller? Yep, sorry, we're booked up till Tuesday. Right? Okay. 
they will make the extra effort because you've established that relationship and they want to keep a good customer. Okay. Um, then when they come out, they say, hey, your blower motor's bad or your heat exchanger is dead and you need a new furnace, you can trust them. You know they will give you good pricing and do good work. Okay, because you've already established that relationship and seen their history. Okay, hey, uh, just remind me about they're talking about the heat pump. They're um, very popular now. Yeah, do you recommend those? Yeah, heat pump's great. All heat pump is, uh, it's a little tricky to think about. An air conditioner, right? We take the heat from the house, we put it into some refrigerant, and we cycle that outside and blow it into the air. Inside is 70 degrees, outside is 105. But we're taking the heat from outside, inside. Blowing it out. Heat pump in the winter time just switches that pump cycle and it takes the heat from outside, even though it's five degrees, collects it. There's a little heat here and there and there. Little heat, little heat, little heat. Puts it in the box, brings it into the house, and lets it go. Okay, that's all heat pump is. So it's just it's it's just a reversing valve in a regular air conditioner and a couple of bits and bobs. I have an older window unit mm -hmm. still works very well. The mm -hmm. problem is, is that the company that made that is mm -hmm. non-existent. Mm -hmm. And the filter they said is paper thin in this air conditioner. And it's just falling apart. And I can't find anything or know anybody to repair a window unit. For yeah. That filter. Yeah. Well, window units are hardly usually, usually they are not even worth repairing. Um, uh, it is for us. That's, I was going to say, I was going to say, um, the, the, um, but the thing is those old window units, they hardly need repair, right? That compressor is going to last. Filter right. Is um, so what you can do, um, the filter, air conditioning filters, by the way, are not meant to keep the air clean for you to breathe. That's a lie. You want to know what else is? Duct cleaning. Don't get me started. <laughs> What a scam. I hate those guys. Okay. And those gals too. I don't want to be sexist. They could be women duck cleaners. They're garbage too. I don't like them. All right. Uh, off of that for a second. Uh, air filters are there to keep the equipment clean. Okay. So if you go to. Um, I've, I've been looking like at Lenar's hair, but mine is so thin on there. Mm -hmm. process, yep. It's paper thin and there is, you know, there's, uh, there's nothing really there. Honestly, oh, you know what? You know what you could okay there's two there's two things that i can think of right off the top of my head okay the first thing is you, you can probably find it online i don't have a resource for you and it's uh, like uh, the fact that if i'm telling you that it, it, that uh, i can't that's not good okay so here, here are two things you could probably probably pull off one they make washable pet filters like washable filters that are designed for people with like five and six dogs Right, so that you don't have to change your filter every week. You can take this thing out and wash it, put it back. Uh, and they sell them in all big box stores. It's it, it, for your furnace, like air filter. Oh, okay. But when you go look at it, it'll be sort of this black thing, uh -huh. uh, with, and it'll be dogs right on the front of it because it's meant for people who are crazy about dogs. Um, that you, you're probably gonna have to like cut all the plastic off and just cut this thing to size, uh -huh. right? But that's okay. Cut it to size. Maybe just glue some cardboard around the edge so it's got a little because once it's in, it's fine. Yeah, okay. Exactly. The other thing you could do would just be to buy a uh a paper accordion style filter. Um, so like if you're looking at a furnace filter, they come in pleated. Uh -huh. Okay, that kind. The cheapest one they make, okay. It should have it should have what they call a MERV rating on it, and ERV. That's a number. The lower the number, the lowest number you can find is the one you want. If you buy it at the big orange store, it won't have a MERV rating. It'll have like the HD uh, efficiency filter numbers. So, like they made it up. <laughs> like, I don't know why they can't just work with the standard that everybody else in the world works. But they... Anyways, the lower the number, the less effective that, the less um, filtery that filter is going to be. And that's what you want. Take that thing, cut that paper right out and just get the size you want. Cut it with scissors, man. Don't overthink it. And then <laughs> cut it to the shape you want. Again, you want to try and glue something to the edge so you can hold okay, it. Yeah, just for glue, there's just very little space, so you know, I don't. It sticks to the one I'm using. Uh, honestly, I would use like like uh, cereal box cardboard or something, and just okay. just glue it on the edge. Again, just so it's got a little bit of rigidity because you may be able to hold it and get it in there. So 
so it doesn't like crumble up on you. Um, but that should be great. Uh, again, she so I can glue that filter onto the plastic part of the thing that goes in and out. Yeah, you can do that. Okay, yeah, that's right. sure. What kind of glue that will that'll work on that plastic? Gorilla glue. Gorilla, okay. Gorilla glue is good stuff. All so, right. all right. The other question. Yep. Do you recommend? I saw it. I saw it. Yeah, I'll get you next. No, it's okay. Oh, really? Oh. Probably oh. not to shut up. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, is, you is there anybody you could recommend no. for a handyman no. that I that I can trust no. all to get something done? No, I'll tell you this. I used to have uh, like three or four people that are recommended. I used to do it myself when I first started doing these things. I don't really do it anymore at all. Uh, like I said, except for a few people, the three people that I have that I used to recommend also the same thing. And this is why I say you got to make these relationships sometimes. Dude, my list is full. I, I can't keep up with what I have. Don't give me new people. I won't take it. Don't have a, no, I need mean, anybody else. Handyman union? No, ma'am. No <laughs> such thing. Uh, what's that? Anybody else that you know that's a decent person? No. No, I don't know any decent people. <laughs> I, I do know what you mean, and, and I, I wish I had a name to give you because I know it, I know how valuable that is to have. Well, you know, when I when I used to be that, uh, I know the people that relied on me were heartbroken when I said I'm, I'm closing up shop, um, and 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 uh, uh, and if you find a good one, keep them. Uh, but yeah, I don't have anybody names to give you. Yeah. What are your thoughts about painting? Concrete wall, like a basement wall. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not finished, so mm -hmm. you want to paint it. So I'm saying you should use like waterproof paint or. Do you get moisture in your basement? No. Don't worry about it then. Just you know? paint, paint. Yeah. Well, uh, it paint that's that's. For the concrete. Yeah, for for concrete. Um, so uh, I would um, not recommend your like cheapest basic latex paint. Um, but you you go to the paint store, you tell them the surface you're painting, or there's. Brick or block or 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 poured concrete and nice and shiny or not so shiny and might have to prime it first. Nothing wrong with painting that. And if there's if you are not trying to block moisture, yeah, anything will work. But if you are blocking moisture, you got to use what it says that it's going to do. That. They they make they make paintable products that are designed to block moisture in basements. How does that keep water from coming up in your basement? It's not going to keep water. Like if you got a leak, right? You can't just paint over. <laughs> right, that'd be some some serious pain, right? Yeah. But what? But what? Some walls are um, they don't have a leak, but they allow an amount of moisture yeah. to seep through over time. Yeah. And when it really rains a lot, it'll just be wet. Um, or the basement is so humid that you'll actually get condensation, which is moving the other way. And then the paint protects the block from that water. Um, but that's all it is. It's not. It's not going to stop a leak. There's no paint that'll What causes the water to come into your bed? A lot of homes. Hydrostatic water. pressure. So remember, your basement wall is below grade. The water is going to build up in the ground. It's quite a bit of pressure pushing against that wall. So when it gets real wet in your ground, any leak, <coughs> any cracks are going to leak through. The key, the real key to keeping water out of the basement in a situation like that is good drainage. Okay. So instead of Trying to figure out how to repair that. I mean, it, once there's a crack, you got to deal with it, right? But the best way to, is to maintain good property grade and solid drainage. If you have things like a drain tile or a French drain or anything like that, make sure that it's being maintained appropriately. Well, I live, live in a real old house, right? And it never used to leak in the basement, but now it leaks in two corners. I'm like, it never did before. Yeah. Over time, the the exterior wall can just break down. So um, yeah, it, is it is it finished or do you just see the concrete? No, you see the concrete. Yeah, and can you see a crack or anything anywhere? No, I mean some of it's got stuff in it, but the one wall back there, I I cut away the mm -hmm. drywall on there, mm -hmm. and I don't see anything, so it has to be underneath where I'm not able. And it's all the moisture's always showing up during the rain, yeah. right? Yeah, and then it starts coming in. If it's not massive yet, like if it's not really doing damage yet. Probably the cheapest option might be actually to talk to a landscaper. Again, if you can increase drainage away from the house, that's going to be the cheapest uh, person to get out there and do that. Really. Um, because uh, like U.S. waterproofing or something like that, what they're going to want to do is dig a trench around your whole house, spray the exterior with a waterproof membrane, and put a drain tile in. It'll be effective, 
but it's going to cost quite a bit of money. Oh, yeah. Um, whereas a landscaper is going to say, oh, I'll, I'll build up some extra wood chips here around the house. We can clear out those bushes. I'll grade this. And it's going to be a lot cheaper. So. Okay. Yeah, of course. Of course. Thank you. Well, my neighbor had this, and they fluffed up all the ground. And, yeah. You know. Kevin. Yeah, for the garage door. Garage door. Yeah, anything is moving on that we can do by ourselves. So. Yeah, I was going to say, that's actually on on, on uh, a, a, one of the lists for me, uh, things that you definitely should be doing yourself. Loop up those garage doors. They sell garage door lubricant. This stuff's just as good, okay? Um, this stuff's just as good. You want to spray the rollers, okay? Um, and if you have a chain, um, you want to grease the chain annually. If you have a belt, those don't need to be belted. Um, and if you have a cable that winds up on a spool, those don't need grease. But if you have the chain, like the big bike chain, uh, they, they sell chain grease that you want to, again, put on once a year. Just follow the instructions. Super easy. One other thing, uh, because it freezes here, I actually like to oil, and you can use anything. You can use old motor oil. You can use something like this. Um, the rubber steel on the uh, bottom of the garage door. Uh, because if that thing gets really wet, especially like if there's a lot of leaves or something, it can freeze to the ground. And then when you go push the button, the motor is totally strong enough to go, right? And some of the safeties don't know to stop on the lift. They know to stop on the, on the push, right? But not on the lift. So they will and strip out this plastic gear, which is not that hard to replace and not very expensive. So if you're sitting there pushing the button and you can hear it and it will like move and but nothing happens, that little plastic gear is supposed to strip out if the motor ever pulls hard on a door that's locked in place for some reason. Um, and I've seen that happen a couple of times. So, yeah. Uh, so I have a question on fire alarm. So mm -hmm. um, one of the nights the fire alarm went off for like just like a couple of seconds and shut off by itself. Okay. So we we'll figure out what was wrong and why what caused it to battery operated? Yeah, battery operated. Yeah. I'd replace the battery and not worry about it if it didn't happen again. Um that would be but other than battery, could there be any other reason like in winter time it's recorded in the night, middle of the night? Um it went off literally for a matter of seconds and then yeah, like couple of seconds and then it whatever happened I wouldn't I wouldn't even worry about it if it happens once a week yeah start looking into what's going on but one time in the middle of the night I, you're never gonna you'll drive yourself nuts trying to figure out the myriad of things that could have caused that but I would replace the battery so mm -hmm. but the garage door chain yep is the WD 40 all you need no, uh, the WD-40 is fine for the rollers and fine for the rubber steel on the bottom. The chain, you actually want to get chain grease, okay? And all the big stores that, that sell anything for garage doors will have that, okay? It goes on the chain, mm -hmm. WD-40 goes on the... On the rollers. So, so you just yeah. rub it on there yourself? I'll yep, yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do you do? Um, I know you get the here, but what the roller? Do you do that angle? The lube on the rollers? Yeah. 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 That that's I I do it all in the fall because that's it's the winter that's hardest on that stuff. All right. Uh, I think I think we, I think we should wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Please, Dan. Stop talking. Oh, I got. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, I want to thank you guys for coming. I hope you got something out of this. I had a lot of fun. Uh, and I hope you did too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.